So, without further ado, I want to introduce our first contributor to the stage. I regret to announce that our scheduled contributor, Nikki Clayton, could not make it here today. However, in her absence, Nikki has provided us with a video showcasing some of her research into the perceptive abilities of jays, as elucidated by their unique responses to magic effects. Furthermore, we are also very fortunate to host her collaborator and close friend, Mark Baldwin, OBE. Mark has a long-running association with the distinguished dance company Rambe, both as a dancer and as artistic director, and received his OBE in 2016 for his contributions to dance. In addition to regular dancing sessions together, Mark also collaborates with Nikki as academic visitor at her Comparative Cognition Lab in Cambridge. I invite now Mark to touch on Nikki's work and their work together before we showcase the video contribution. Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Mark. <laughs> uh, I usually give talks like this with uh, my scientist friend, Nikki Clayton, and next to me, she's really tiny. Uh, we were in um, Washington, D.C. to open the first conference on dance in the brain, uh, which was amazing. And uh, I didn't know I was going until a couple of weeks before Nikki rang me up and said, oh, we must do, do this uh, lecture demonstration. And... Uh, we try and keep our stuff low tech, uh, and we've been doing this since uh, uh, 2009, uh, when as artistic director of Rombert, um, I, uh, I was beginning to commission work, and I wanted to commission some science stuff. And, um, and I was looking around for a scientist. I knew Darwin's great-grandson, uh, here, dropping names, uh, Stephen Keynes. And he introduced me to several scientists, and one of them said, I think this is a ridiculous idea that you should make a dance about evolution. And just as he said that, I thought, oh, actually, it's a really good idea to me. And, um, and he told me all these wonderful stories about a dancing fly, that the fly uh, wraps a, a present up for its partner, and he gives it to his lady friend, and while he's doing it, she's unwrapping it and uh, she gets to eat the prize. And then some of the flies just had the web without a present inside. So he was calling that evolution. And uh, there was another one with a fish, um, and the fish had a spot on its side. Um, and suddenly all the spots disappeared. But if you take that fish and put it into another stream, the spot comes back. So I was learning about evolution in all kinds of different ways. And uh, Nikki arrived with her uh, bird stories, and the first thing she did uh, in an in interview with The Guardian, because um, actually uh, these are collaborations that don't just happen with a scientist and a choreographer or an artist. So we had Judith McCrell, who's a friend of Nikki and I, who was the dance critic for The Guardian. We had Kadir Atia, a really famous French Algerian artist who's just brilliant. Um, and we had a taxidermist, Georg Meyerweil, and he said, you know, you unwrap everything, then you make up new stuffing and stick it back in and put the skin back on. And that sounded wonderful to me. So Kadir got him to make these pods that look like maggot pods, which the dancers came out of. And Nikki came up with the idea that um, it would be just three things, reveal, conceal. So they were black at the back and white at the front. So you could see them quite clearly dancing. Uh, everything stolen, of course, from nature, because she showed us all these wonderful videos of uh, birds of paradise in New Guinea with their, with their big um, top knots. <laughs> uh, and... Actually, what happens is they fluff their feathers up, and it just looks like a tutu. And they do all these elaborate footwork. It's quite brilliant. And so instead of choreographing that, I just nicked the whole lot. Hey, dancers, learn this. And some of them were brilliant at it, you know, and of course they were in the piece. Um, and that sounds terribly cruel, but that's what we did. And Nikki helped me. And of course the female bird sits up in the branches, and so she needs a particular view. Um, and so all these things came into consideration, but Conceal Reveal was absolutely amazing, because when they turned up stage, because they were black at the back, they kind of 
disappeared. But I have worked with uh, um, scientists before. Sorry, I'm pacing. And uh, the first piece I did uh, was with the Institute of Physics. Brownian motion, the photoelectric effect, and E equals MC squared. It was like, but I'm a dancer. Uh, but actually, uh, I had my own scientist for three months, and he would come and have afternoon tea with me. And then one day, he said, I've got the Brownian motion thing. He brought up one of his dog's toys, and it was like a ball. You wind it up. Oh, no, it's got a battery. You press go on the battery, and it bounces around all over the place. And he said that was a perfect example of Brownian motion because it's like a particle, there's no up, there's no sideways, there's no top, bottom, and, um, and so I show, again, I show that to the dancers. So it's actually having experts explain to the dancers some of this stuff. It was a little bit more difficult with E equals MC squared, but we managed it. Um, and I used uh, an amazing uh, feature film art director. And so, the, you know, the stage was full of color you know, because uh, blue is the one with some energy and red looks lovely on stage. So we, we, we came up with all these amazing things. We went to the Hedron Collider because uh, Ariane Koak, who used to run the artist interaction, uh, asked me. And I took uh, a, a, a composer, Cheryl Francis Hode with me. I can see a composer. And... Um, and also a, a brilliant artist called Katie Patterson. If you haven't seen her work, look out for it. She uses science to make stuff. And, uh, but uh, how it actually happened with Nikki is I used to know someone who ran the proms called Sir John Drummond. And he sadly passed away, but he left me some money in his will. So I was able to afford to have Julian Anderson write the music. So uh, if you're interested in working in the arts, it's about bringing people together. So think of your most favorite team in the world, the most seriously good composer, the genius artist who's taking over the MoMA, you know, and uh, the most amazing scientist you can think of. And it's actually working together, working how you can work together. I think it's very unusual for Nikki and I to work together for so long because... Um, you know, usually they, they would come to Rombert, because I ran it for 16 years, a lot of projects, as I said, uh, 60, uh, and then they never kind of work together again. So actually, uh, that word collaboration is quite powerful when it comes to uh, bringing people together, and we seem to have lasted all this time. I'm not quite sure why. I think it's because I don't drink and she does. Um, and so... <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, the things that she can explain, I can't explain, and, uh, and vice versa. I mean, she says that without me, she wouldn't have come up with the phrase avian tango. Um, and I think, I think we could show it now, actually. Magic tricks are a fascinating window on our minds. Indeed. Do I have anything behind my ear? I doubt it. Anything in my hand? Of course not. Which means that this should be physically impossible. They highlight gaps in our perception and attention, which magicians exploit to disguise what's in front of our eyes. I suppose the coin would be just there. Thank you very much. But what about other animals? Do they fall for the same tricks we do? Could their susceptibility to magic tricks highlight flaws in their perception? Or could an ability to be misled actually reveal kinds of intelligence we didn't know they had? How did you become interested in doing magic tricks for animals? Well, I've always wanted to be a bird. I've always wanted to fly and move around three-dimensionally and think like a bird. So that's how I got into science. But also, through my passion for dance, I met Professor Clive Wilkins, who's artist in residence in the Department of Psychology, and he's a professional magician. And we both shared a great interest in memory and mental time travel through different perspectives, art and science. 
I visited Cambridge University's Comparative Cognition Lab to see how the group are examining the mental abilities of jays using magic tricks. Jays are extremely intelligent. We call them the feathered apes because they're on a cognitive par with the chimpanzees. And they're also very attentive. They really watch what you're doing. And so they became the perfect subjects. Elias Garcia Pellegrin spent months working with the birds in order to prepare for the experiments. So one of the things that Eli was able to do was to train them to peck a thumb to ask them which hand they thought concealed the object he'd hidden. This trick is known as a French drop. Good job, baby. The jays don't fall for it, but perhaps that's not surprising. When humans watch the trick, we assume that the left hand is grasping the worm. Your brain uses shortcuts when you perceive these movements. It just goes, well, what's the most likely thing to happen? Well, the most likely thing to happen is that when this hand grabs an object, the most likely thing is for a completed transfer to occur. And that's where magicians are very good, because they are very good at seeing um, how to make a movement which is deceptive so unlike a real movement that the brain does not notice it. Even though there are particular kinematics that would tell you that this movement is fake, right? Like the tension. But you don't see that because you're just using the shortcuts in perception. However, birds don't need these expectations to survive because they do not have hands. But the birds do fall for some other tricks. Have a look. Where is it? Here. You're wrong. It's not. On my visit, it wasn't just the birds being treated to a show. Sam, do you remember the uh, £10 note we talked about? Could I borrow it now? Yes, I can let you tell. Excellent. Thank you very much. Watch carefully. When I watch this trick, I'm pleasantly surprised by the increase in my fortunes. But a similar trick was used to make the Jays think their favourite snack had been replaced with a different one. That's a 20 pound note. Basically what we did is that we showed Stuka the waxworm in this case, we pretended to deposit it inside the cup, and then we turned the cups around. Then Stuka went in and chose to retrieve the cup where she saw we put the waxworm in. But in doing so, she found that magically, the waxworm had transformed into a mealworm. And then we measured how long it took Stuka here, or any of the birds that we tested, to actually ingest, to eat the worm, okay? And we found that when we did this case, a devalue condition, so their first preferred item magically transformed into their less preferred item, they took way longer that when we did an up value condition, so their less preferred item in this case, transformed into their most preferred item. Think uh, about the magic effect that Clive did for you, okay? You were happy because a 10 pound note became a 20 pound note, that's great, right? But what if Clive takes your 10 pound note and transforms it into five pound note? Ah, it's not that happy anymore, right? You're not that willing to take that five pound note anymore. You want to give it back. You want Clive to transform it into a 10 pound note again, don't you? That's what happened here. Are you doing any magic experiments with any other animals besides Corvids? We're hoping to do some magic effects with primates. And we're also excited about exploring some of these ideas with cephalopods, cuttlefish, octopus, squid. You do get attached to these animals, especially when you spend a long time working with them. You notice their different personalities. Gone are the days of like scientists with white lab coats, not having any feelings for their subjects. We've learned too much about what's going on in their minds to just treat them as just banal subjects. Because these are not banal subjects. These, these animals can think, they can feel, they understand the past, the present and the future. And I, I don't see any point for me not to treat them as such, if, if this makes sense.
Yeah, uh, amazing. Uh, the thing about hanging out with Nikki is that she can always find scientists, science and everything. And as we toured Comedy of Change, which was a piece about evolution, in the cities we went to, her and I, or sometimes just her or sometimes just me, gave talks about the work and about evolution. Um, and uh, we had always asked the local scientist um, to come and talk. So we had the evolution of sex. Um, and just at that moment, a public, uh, a Catholic school arrived with all these little children, and I went over and said uh, to the woman who's looking after them, "Oh, all the talks about sex today. Is that okay?" She said, "We're a Catholic school, but it's fine." Um, and uh, and then we had uh, the marine biologist, who, when he heard it was Nikki Clayton, he's going, "Oh, animal behaviour." what you need is marine biology. And so it went on like that as we toured the country, which was a lot of fun. I wonder if we could show one of my films at the moment. And this was a, after a visit to the Hedron Collider. Um, actually, you could show a little bit of this one here. Nikki came up with a timeline that uh, started with primordial soup and ended with um, a mobile phone. And uh, yeah, can you play some of the music? It's Haydn's a creation. Um, and of course, it's great for dancers to be able to talk to Nikki uh, about evolution, you know, about below and above, about red light and blue light, about fungi, algae, but most, of, uh, especially, of course, birds. But I just want to show you uh, one last clip before I finish. Uh, that was uh, in South Africa. I went to work with Lady Smith back Mombazo. Um, it's a Zulu group. And uh, this was one of the dancers in Rombert, Dane Hurst. And um, actually, uh, it's, it's mental time travel, this one, which is one of Nikki's most favorite things. And mine now, too. <laughs> Nikki loved this because that's Umbalelo Nabene um, and Dane Hurst who dance in Rombert. Uh, and the tall guy is, was a principal from the Royal, Royal Ballet, but she was, uh, you know, really enthralled because they hadn't heard that music uh, since they were children. So there was a mental time travel thing going on. Um, and actually, if you're a choreographer like me, you're using mental time travel all the time, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and then projecting into the future how I, I could use that experience. The, the tough thing about presenting stuff that has science in it is explaining it to an audience. Uh, you know, and uh, of course an audience has come to see some dance. Uh, sometimes they don't want to think about things like that. But actually it's lovely to leave an audience with something to think about. The gorgeousness, the beauty, the physicality, the incredible music, and then a little, little something to think about. So I'm, I just want to play this as the last thing, and it's a scientist explaining dance. Uh, this is from the Hedron Collider. He's a cosmologist stationed there. Um, and uh, yeah, there he is. That's it. That's, yeah, that's it. Can you play that one, please? Neutrons and protons are made up of these things called quarks. A proton is a particular configuration of three quarks, and a neutron is another one. Quarks do different things depending on how they're paired up with each other. So uh, by themselves, they just sort of whiz around. When they meet other quarks, uh, they start to sort of do a dance, if you like. They orbit each other in a particular way. And the cool thing about quarks is that they respond to the strongest force 
there exists in, in nature, the strong nuclear force. And what they do is they keep sort of firing these other particles called gluons in between them. They exchange gluons with each other and, and it's a very, very energetic exchange process. And, and they just become really, really tightly bound together. As quarks exist in protons and neutrons, they're just sort of whizzing around in this configuration where there's three of them in a stable configuration bound together by glue. Physics itself is a very complicated and, and you know, hard to put into words subject because it's primarily expressed through mathematics. But the oddest thing about nature, at least at the level of fundamental physics, is the more we try to understand it, the deeper and deeper we get, the more and more beautiful it starts to look to us. You know, nature really likes simplicity. There are some people think that ultimately nature is fundamentally described by tiny vibrating strings and that all the different particles are different notes in the string. The, the deeper and deeper we get, the more and more aesthetically pleasing it becomes in some sense after the fact that, I mean, it's very messy when we're trying to figure it out and we get it wrong all the time. But once you understand what it actually happens, you find that it's, there's something very beautiful about it. The, the sort of journey of discovery in physics has been also a journey of finding you know, the deeper, more, if you like, elegant truths of the universe. Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>